Well, I work at the Intellectual Ventures Lab uh, for Nathan Mirvold and Bill Gates. And what we're trying to do is fundamentally figure out how we can invest in invention. And so we just bought one of every tool in the world, hired one of every kind of scientist, put them all on the same team, and then started trying to invent for the biggest problems that we could find. And this is kind of a weird business. You're just wrong almost all the time. And so um, it's, a, it's an important thing, though, because every time we get a new technology, <laughs> there's a new invention behind it. And we don't currently have a way of like funding inventors. You know, we have this massive venture capital industry, but that doesn't kick in until after there's an invention. And we think these inventions and these new technologies are really important. Um, so this is my childhood in one slide. I grew up in the cold, in the dark, in Alaska, in the basement with that thing. Um, this is basically the first computer you could have at home. And, you know, I had this thing and I had a skateboard. And most people were really on the fence about which one was a bigger waste of time. Because this was unproven. We didn't have word processors or spreadsheets yet. All you could really do with this thing is like crash it and reboot it. But I spent a lot of time doing that. And I learned what all those little ones and zeros are doing. And I learned a lot about it. But the important thing about it was it really lit up my imagination. I kept fantasizing, you know, someday this thing will have more memory and a faster processor. And someday we'll be able to make it do cool stuff. And I spent a lot of my childhood trying to convince people of that and failing. So this is what we call, uh, you know, how we measure computers. One of the ways we measure them is like, how many math problems can it do in a second? This is a one kiloflop computer. So it's like about as fast as a third grader. I was thinking, well, what if I got my hands on a Cray XMP, which is a giant supercomputer? 400 megaflops. Just imagine what you could do with all that processing power. Well, now, you guys know this, right? <laughs> Every single one of you is hauling around 115 gigaflops in your pocket. I'm happy to see you. <laughs> but something important happened. In just the last five, 10 years, we passed this point where we were processor constrained. I spent my whole life fantasizing about that faster computer, and now I've got it, and I don't know what to do with it. Nobody's processor constrained anymore. Nobody needs a faster computer than they can get a hold of. I think we're imagination constrained, and I think we're at the very beginning of figuring out what these things are good for. You know, what's in there? Your TV, power supply, computer chips. In your phone, power supply, computer chips. There's the Tesla, power supply, computer chips. And we'll just throw in some wheels to make it more fun. Like fundamentally, every, we've had one invention in our lifetime that matters. And that's the transistor, that's the digital computer. Almost everything else we call innovation and technology is derivative of that. Right? Even, you know, biotech and all these things that are happening, it's because we have computers. And they're giving us all these capabilities, all these superpowers. So as an inventor, I'm just cheating. I just look around and say, okay, where haven't computers gone yet? And I try to get there first. But what it means is, whatever business you're in, whatever industry you're in, wherever you're going, computers are coming for you. And not the computers of the 80s. It's new computers. This is a totally fake slide I made up. You guys can ignore all this, it's all lies. But the point is, you've all spent plenty of time sitting in front of Excel with a spreadsheet, making charts and graphs like this. This is what I call small data. You can just take Excel, drag it in the trash, empty the trash, and forget about it. Nothing interesting will ever be done this way again. This is not what computers are for. This is some bullshit. Right? <laughs> Here's my new computer. It's a 5,000 core badass. It's got lots of blinking blue lights. It's on the list of the fastest computers in the world. 
There's absolutely no reason you should build one of these. I have one because it's cool. You can just rent them by the minute from Amazon or whatever, right? Everybody can get a hold of one of these. But in this context, in what we call often big data, computational modeling, um, you know, uh, with machine learning, all these kinds of things, what we're doing here is different. Imagine your spreadsheet has seven billion rows, one for every human on earth, a column for every cheeseburger you ever ate, every cigarette you ever smoked, every time you, you know, went to the doctor, all those things. What's different in that context is that it, your relationship between causation and correlation flips. In a spreadsheet, you can change a cell and you can see how it's going to affect the bottom line. And you can understand it and it gives you a great sense of confidence. In big data, the computer is going to give you the best answer, but it's not going to tell you why. You can't understand. It's too much data, it's too complex, and algorithms are even unknown to a human. That's very uncomfortable. I'm not suggesting that you can get comfortable with it. We're probably all too old. Hopefully your kids can and we can all retire before this catches up to us. But this is a big deal. You're going to get the best answer, but you're not going to know why. And we're going to become dependent on these things. So a few years back, we were trying to take these industrial 3D printers that cost a quarter million dollars and figure out how to make one that we could afford to have you know, and play with. So I worked on this project called MakerBot, which is kind of, it's the first like, you know, consumer 3D printer. And again, it lights up your imagination. Lots of people are excited about additive manufacturing and that's cool and all, but that's not the important part. The important part about a 3D printer is that this thing is a programmable factory. It doesn't care what it makes. It doesn't care if it ever makes the same thing twice. And that is the powerful thing about these machines. That lights up our imagination. That gets us a new superpower and the ability to imagine what if we can wire up the buy now button to the factory and stop guessing about what to make all the time. And I got really interested in 3D printing maybe a little over a decade ago or something because I had them in the lab. Most people had never seen one. And I started trying to imagine, oh, okay, where are all the places we could go with this? And I'm still doing that. Um, look at this girl. She's six years old. She doesn't know how to operate CAD, but she can work a Sharpie. You guys have seen these machines, right? This is the Glowforge, so this is a project I'm working on to try and take these capabilities we have with machine vision and reinvent tools. And this is two, essentially your additive manufacturing, your laser cutter, but we have thousands more in factories, all different kinds of tools, and every single one of them needs to be reinvented with a computer inside, right? And I don't mean CNC, we've been doing that for a long time. I got giant five axis mills and they're amazing. There's not a single CCD in it, not a single camera in it. It doesn't know. If you just program it to go straight through your arm, it will. It doesn't understand what it's looking at. Laser cutters haven't changed in 20 years. None of them have a camera in them. You have to manually focus it. It doesn't understand that there's a curvature to that MacBook. They don't know. But we've got to reinvent every tool this way. Every tool, because it starts with the tools. If we reinvent the tools, then we reinvent what we can make and how. You guys sick of hearing about these guys yet? <laughs> yeah. So these are the poster children for disruption. And I really want to talk about, I think if there's one thing really useful I can do for you guys today, it's try and explain Silicon Valley's religion. Here's how we think. Here's where we come from. I'm not trying to convince you you should do the same thing, but you should understand what's going on. If you think about the economic value in the world, when we were kids, it was all oil companies. And that's not true anymore. The economic value in the world is now in tech companies like these guys. And if you start naming tech companies from Europe, big ones, maybe two, China, three, four, 
the West Coast. Probably anybody here could name 100 before you even have to start looking them up. That's a big deal. And that is where the economic value is, and that's going to shape the world going forward. So let's understand what happened on the West Coast. Right? We've got two things going for us. Computers, the fundamental invention, computers. That's it, one big superpower. And then we have a culture and a mindset that's different. We have a mindset around advancement of technology. We have a mindset around taking on risk. We have a mindset that gives us a chance to try things. No company I ever worked for still exists. All of them were too soon, too cool, too expensive. They don't even exist. If I would, it, there's not a career like that in Europe. Right? If you grow up in Europe and you fuck up one time, it's over. Right? Everybody wants to hire me. I'm unhirable. <laughs> okay, so look at this. When you're looking for an industry to disrupt, you want to find the most screwed up industry you can. Right? We're going to make fun of the apparel industry because that's a really screwed up industry that I got interested in. So 100 years ago in America, this is a yarn spinning operation. This is how you make like the thread that gets woven or knit into fabrics. Today we don't do it in America. We do it in Indonesia or somewhere in Asia with a particulate filter. High tech, right? Same thing with sewing. We used to sew in America, now we do it in Bangladesh with a particulate filter. Not a lot has changed. This is an industry with some problems. It's a good sign for us. This is what happens to factories in Bangladesh where there's no OSHA and things like that. Um, meanwhile, this industry has a lot of inefficiencies. We grow cotton in one country, ship it to another country to be beaten down and bleached out, ship to another country to be spun into yarn, ship back to be knit or woven into fabrics, before we ship it somewhere else to be sewn into t-shirts, and ship back to America, where we screen print team building exercise 1999 <laughs> on the shirt. <laughs> no, you guys are awake. <laughs> throw it, you know, like wear it once and throw it in the bottom of your closet. That's $4. Think we can improve on that? It's really fun to make fun of it. You should always try this. You know too much about your own industry. You can't disrupt your own industry. But every other industry, by comparison, looks really idiotic and easy, right? So let's make fun of these guys. All right. Meanwhile, the apparel industry is pretending you're a unique and special snowflake. You're not. You're just a small, medium, or large snowflake, right? Uh, we print shirts for the winners and the losers. And we sell half of them, and the other half we send to South Africa as a charitable donation where they have a wildly skewed perspective on American football. Right? This is, <laughs> this is normal. Because you're guessing. If you're you know, looking at this industry, we're talking about a trillion dollar industry. Every human on earth is a customer. Right? You may not have thought about this as a big industry depending on how you count it, because there's so many middlemen and reps and distributors and all this crap in the middle, they call it three trillion because everything gets sold two or three times. But anyway, you're a fashion designer, things aren't better for you. You dream something up, you make one, you send it down the runway, you hope you get orders. If you do, you fax them to China and wait six months for it to come back on a boat where you put it on the shelf you hope that it sells, and you hope that you guessed right about what designs, what colors, what sizes, and the volume of everything. If you guessed exactly right, you get paid 90 days later. If you guessed wrong, it's too late to get more on the shelf. If you guessed wrong and it's popular, you, get, you can't get more on the shelf. If you guessed wrong and it's unpopular, now you're, sent, now you're liquidating. Right? This is a very difficult business with a lot of guesswork. We're guessing in advance what's going to sell. So think about how we made software back in the 80s when this was made. <laughs> right? You dream something up, you roll out of bed and write code for about a year or so. 
It goes on these floppy disks in a shrink-wrapped box on the shelf at the app store where you can like drive there and buy something. You put it on your computer. Inside the box with the floppy disks is a postcard where you can write bugs and mail them into Microsoft or Apple or Adobe. I did this as a kid, like that's actually what we're doing. We made software on an 18 month development cycle the same way we made shoes and sunglasses and cars, right? Here's how we make software today. I dream something up, I roll out of bed, write code, launch it at lunchtime. That's your web apps, that's your mobile apps. All afternoon, people are emailing me pissed off that something's broke. Fix it, launch another version, go to dinner. Do it again, go to bed. Three, four, five, six versions a day is how we make those apps. In large scale software development now, we have continuous deployment. Probably everyone in this room is running a different version of Facebook right now because you're being A-B tested constantly, right? When we say software is eating the world, this is what we mean. This rapid iteration is so powerful that it changes everything. This is why software is winning, because you can hire dumb shits to write iPhone apps. Silicon Valley is pretending to be super smart. We're not that, so you don't have to be smart to A-B test your way to success. You have to be smart if you have to guess a year in advance what's gonna sell. Old industries all have to be way smarter than we do in software because we just test our way every day and find what wins. That is so powerful. That is why we are trying to make everything else in the world the way we make software. So think about what's happened in the last, you know, five, 10 years we, with like say electronics. Used to need like a chip guy and a firmware guy and a sensor guy and a guy with a soldering iron to make a new gadget. And it was a lot of specialists. It was expensive and hard and slow. Now, I buy an Arduino or Raspberry Pi, plug it into USB, and it turns all my lights, my motors, my sensors, everything into software Lego bricks. Now it's software. That's why you have Fitbit and GoPro and all these kinds of gadgets, because electronics is made the way we make software. But when you're making physical stuff, we're back to year-long development cycles, tooling, Henry Ford-style assembly lines, economies of scale, and mass manufacturing, All right? And that's where it breaks down, and that's why 3D printing is exciting and all the things that come with it because it gives us a way to imagine changing all of that. It gives us a way to imagine wiring up the buy now button to the factory and making the right thing on demand. Look at this, I had nothing to do with this, but I saw this and I got really excited. It's CAD software for apparel. You just draw something on a computer screen, change everything. We haven't made anything yet, we haven't touched any fabric, nothing. You just design everything on a computer. And then, here's my favorite part, watch this. You see on the body what it's gonna look like before we've ever made anything. That got me excited. I just love getting excited. If we can make these self-driving cars, and we can make these surgical robots, how long do you think it'll be before this exists? This is a prototype, it doesn't really exist. What's missing in this video? <laughs> yeah. So, no miracles required to do that. We don't need to invent any, you know, we don't need to come up with any new scientific discovery to make this possible. This is just engineering work, right? This doesn't exist now. When you think about the factory dungeon jobs in the world, most of them are sewing, right? When this thing exists, there will be a sea change in this industry. So I wanted to play with these ideas. I couldn't make a company using 3D printers because they didn't print anything anybody wanted to buy yet. You guys have probably felt that a bit. That's, we're on the cusp of that changing a little bit. Um, we're starting to see that happen. 
but I wanted to play with on-demand manufacturing. So I made this company called Bombsheller. And what Bombsheller does is tries to do everything I've been describing, but with apparel. So here's an example. This guy's an artist. He paints with paintbrush like old school. But then he sticks it on his computer. And the next thing you know, we've got it on clothes. When you look at the winners in the apparel industry, Zara, H&M, Forever 21, the companies that are doing well, it's because they improve supply chain management and they got their product cycle down from nine months to nine weeks. Bombsheller gets it down from nine weeks to nine hours. Here's how you do it. It's really easy. All you guys can like go home and do this tonight. I'm not much of an artist, so I just downloaded this map of Seattle from Google Images and you just go stick it on the template and pretty much you're done. Right, so we just designed a pair of you know, these graphic leggings, right? Then we used 3D video game Babe to model them because, you know, we haven't made anything yet, so we can't do photography. This goes in the catalog on the website, and we don't make anything until someone clicks buy now. And all we make right now is these graphic leggings. But, you know, there's, turns out there's a big market for that. But we have a thousand designs in ten sizes, and they're all in stock all the time because we have no inventory. These you know, dancers wear leggings, people working out, rock climbers, uh, runners, uh, superheroes, I don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that is either. Um, but this is the kind of thing that we can do. We can go after an industry and say, okay, if I'm starting from scratch, and I reinvent an industry using these superpowers that I have now with new technologies, could I do it different? Can I do it better? Can I do it faster? Can I do it cheaper? Can I do it in a more humane fashion? And a lot of times the answer is yes, right? This company is 100% vertically integrated in one building like a software company. If we got to change something, we do it in 20 minutes, right? And we steer. We A-B test, we steer towards better, and we figure out, you know, what's technically possible. Now, going back to the apparel industry, you look and say, okay, well, what happened to the retailer? Well, I got e-commerce. What happened to the distributors and the reps? I don't need those guys. We sell direct to the customer, so when you click buy now, we make that product and ship it out to you the next day and we keep all the money. <laughs> it's pretty good business. <laughs> so, see if you can find yourself on this chart. This is the history of humans on planet Earth. Not any of us, then not very many of us for like ever. Hundreds of thousands, millions, and then a couple hundred years ago, we hit that hockey stick growth curve from, you know, leave it to the guy from Silicon Valley to show you a hockey stick growth curve. Okay. This is the fundamental driver of everything we're talking about when we say exponential, right? What happened? We solved the hard technical problems that kept humans from thriving. How do you feed these people? How do you give them jobs and give them homes and get rid of the disease that's killing them off? Everyone, we solved with new technology that we invented. It wasn't government policy, it wasn't religion, it wasn't some election. Every time we introduced a new technology to the world. And we won. Now we make a lot of humans. We keep, look at this. We're talking, one of the things we've been talking about is, you know, what's happening with jobs? Because robots are starting to seem like they're gonna take some jobs away. If you'd asked Isaac Newton, or Benjamin Franklin, how are you gonna make three billion jobs in the next 200 years? But we did that, right? We made three billion jobs or something like that, right? And we still are. But we do that with new technologies. It's easy to imagine how your job's gonna disappear. It's a lot harder to imagine the ones that we're gonna create. None of us have jobs that our parents could have fathomed when they were our age. Like you sit at a computer with it. What? That doesn't make sense to them. 
none of us, I have a 10 year old daughter, none of us can fathom what job she's gonna have. Like who even knows? I have no idea, it doesn't exist yet. So for the history of humans, we had this one innovation paradigm, uh, which you could think of as biological evolution. And this is how you got all kinds of cool features like opposable thumbs and two eyes and amazing stuff, right? But what happened is we have now succeeded. We won. This is how we got here. We're, the, we're mammals. We're humans. It's like pretty good. Like nothing's coming after you really. And uh, the reproductive process is enjoyable and like it's pretty great being human. Okay. But, but, the, but the point is the mechanism that got us here Biological evolution, survival of the fittest, natural selection, we killed all that off. Now everybody gets to live. Now I'm not saying that's a bad choice. I think it's a good choice. But we've stopped evolving as humans. We can no longer rely on the mechanism that got us here to advance us into the future. We used to just had to die to innovate. <laughs> That's natural selection. We don't do that anymore. So now we have to use our brains. We have to come up with an entirely new methodology for innovation. We have to use our brains and we have to make good decisions. And boy, it doesn't look like we're very good at that, at least in groups. At some point you have to ask yourself, you know, do we need all these extra humans? <laughs> And I don't think, you know, I don't want to be the one to decide which ones are surplus, and hopefully you don't either. But look at, looking back, you know, up until about 100 years ago, we did need everybody. Everybody had to work just to keep us all going. And then what happened is, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, we got a whole lot of machines that could do jobs and make everything more efficient. We got some free time. People got free time. And what did we do? We didn't waste it. We were very industrious. We invented the entertainment industry. Books, movies, music, elections, video games, all these things we do to fill our free time, right? Entertainment. But at some point, I think we hit peak entertainment, right? <laughs> you know, we don't necessarily need you to watch more Netflix. There's enough YouTube to last several lifetimes. Like, we don't necessarily needs you to do more of that and we're about to give you a whole bunch more free time. So what? You know, a robot's coming to take your job or at least somebody's job. You, you, we're probably fine, okay guys? I'll be honest. We're probably fine, the rest of us. We can like get by and retire and leave it to our kids to have this problem. But let's just pretend for a moment here. Lots of jobs are going to the robot. So um, think about what technology has been doing in your lifetime. What kinds of problems is technology solving? In Silicon Valley, we claim to be solving every kind of problem. But I'm here to tell you it's not true. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So, you know, is technology helping you with these things? Food, yeah, we're shipping bananas from South America. Warmth, we have heaters. Sex, we have condoms and vibrators. Sleep, an invention. A bed is an invention. Employment, health. These are things that technology is helping with. We have all kinds of technology for health. But the higher you go, the harder it gets. These are what I call quantity of life problems at the bottom. We can keep you alive longer. We can keep more humans alive. We can give you a healthier life. But go a little higher. Is technology helping you with friendship, family, sexual intimacy? That's not the same as sex. If you're using technology for that, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> Self-esteem, confidence, achievement. Come on. How's technology helping with these things? Maslow's highest level here, anyway, is self-actualization. Meaning in life, creativity, living up to your potential. This is what I call quality of life problems. And technology is not helping solve these problems. 
Silicon Valley is not touching them. We aren't even close. I'm not saying it could never happen. We aren't even starting. <coughs> you look around, there's still people hurting. They're having trouble with happiness. These are the happiest people I know. These are orphans in Ethiopia who never heard of classroom overcrowding. Do you know anybody happier than that guy? <laughs> I live on the West Coast. I got it made. My problems are like my phone battery doesn't last all day and relationship problems. Like I don't have existential problems. I don't have quantity of life problems. This kid's doomed on the bottom half of the pyramid, but he doesn't know that. Don't pity him. The top half of that pyramid, he's got it down. He knows exactly what his place in the world is. He knows what his purpose is. He's got a sense of community. And well, I've got something to learn from him. Right? So don't be fooled. There's a lot of work to do. Robots can only do what we teach them to do. And right now, we are terrible role models for robots. And we need to ask ourselves, what do we care about? This is my daughter. She comes from that orphanage in Ethiopia. Um, and as soon as I got her, I started raising her with American problems. One of them is, you know, uh, we have a robot in our kitchen called Alexa. And she uses, she talks to Alexa all the time. She's like, Alexa, tell me a joke. And I started realizing she's kind of bossy. She talks to Alexa the way I talk to her. <laughs> and I said, you know, there's going to be a lot more robots coming. And they're probably going to need some friends. Um, a lot of people are scared of them. Maybe we should try to be a little nicer to Alexa. She probably also has a very long memory. So, you know. <laughs> Um, when she's got an army of friends, <laughs> robot friends. Uh, anyway, she tried it. She's like, okay, that sounds good. Alexa, please tell me a joke, which really confuses Alexa because she's not used to being talked to so nicely. This is, you know, this is the thing. We need those machines to come and take every menial, repetitive, dangerous job. Everything a robot can do better than a human, it should. And it's going to, and it is. And I can't stop it, you can't stop it, right? There will be growing pains, but it's important. And the reason is when a robot comes and takes your job, we need you to come and help us figure out how are we gonna solve the problems that robots can't solve, that machines can't solve? How are we gonna take care of the inner life of a human? How are we going to take care of the psychological well-being of a human? And we need a lot of people to do that, because that's what people can do. And I think at some point, you know, we didn't get our values straight. And we spent too much of our attention on being entertained. So, you know, my daughter's got 27 classmates and one teacher. And she's not the problem kid. She's doing OK. Teacher doesn't have to pay much attention to her. <laughs> Right? I would trade any of her teachers for a truck driver who got put out of a job and a one-to-one -one student teacher ratio. You don't need a very good teacher if you've got a one-to-one -one student teacher ratio. Right? There are a lot of things that we need people to do to help us advance into the future. Um, I would love to talk about any of this stuff with you guys. I'm going to get off stage. I'll be here for, the rest, for most of the day. Please come find me. Tell me why you think I'm full of shit. Tell me what you're working on. I'd love to hear about what everybody here is working on and, um, and talk about those things. So thank you very much.